Now, at the same meeting, International Monetary Fund Managing Director Christine Lagarde says she believes the IMF can work successfully with the Trump administration to improve the global trading system. But open trade must have must be uh, preserved as growth uh, as a growth engine. She also said she saw the need to reduce subsidies and other trade distortions that, of course, limit competition. You know, from the uh, the various contacts that I have had with the uh, with the administration so far. Uh, I have every reason to believe uh, that we will make progress, that we will um, cooperate all together uh, in order to support and indeed improve the system as we have it. Uh, you know, the IMF is not the trade organization, um, but we are concerned about trade because it has been a, a major engine for growth, and it's actually one of the pillars uh, of, uh, of uh, prosperity and growth going forward. So we uh, certainly will be looking at how we can participate in that, how we can continue to support the growth of trade, and how it can be done in the most um, uh, efficient, uh, fair, and global way as possible. And that implies clearly a, a level playing field, uh, no use of distortive measures, uh, and, uh, and, and no protectionist measures uh, going forward. Well, let's get more on the start of those meetings. Daniel Ringis now joins us in Washington. Daniel, welcome to the show. Now, we know this year's meetings seem to be all about uh, two things. That's a move away from protectionist policies and suddenly the support uh, for global uh, trade. Now, what are the issues uh, likely to be debated over the coming days? Well, uh, President Kim of the World Bank uh, made some really strong comments in his press briefing earlier on today, and I want to go through a few of them. First of all, let's not forget about the need for a much more coherent and large-scale response to the famine in East Africa and Yemen, which I think policymakers have begun to address, but not sufficiently, according to uh, many people who are dealing with that crisis. So that certainly needs to be something higher up on the agenda. Secondly, uh, and uh, tangentially, um, the need to, for governments to retain uh, foreign aid support for these financial institutions at a time when some are inward looking and looking to sort of feather at their own nest rather than contribute more to the global economy. And uh, President Kim made a, a very interesting policy uh, shift at the World Bank and other development institutions, namely this, that uh, people should no longer think of foreign aid as being sort of a handout to the poor, uh, but more a way of uh, coalescing the private sector and encouraging the private sector to be involved in development solutions. So, for example, uh, they can do things efficiently, but sometimes they lack uh, the ability to go into countries that are struggling because of the risk issues. And so uh, development institutions can provide risk guarantees, insurance as you were. Uh, but fundamentally, he's looking at a new model of development that is much more focused on coalescing and catalyzing the private sector going forward. He also makes the point that in future, the World Bank believes that two thirds of all current jobs will be done by automation, robots, computers, the like. So there is a major challenge ahead in trying to meet the aspirations of people who've seen the benefits of global economy through the internet and through other media, but could become frustrated if we aren't able to meet those, those growth targets to bring them into the global economy in a more inclusive way. Mm. Now, Daniel, these meetings do start on a somewhat positive note. Uh, we saw earlier this week the IMF did revise up its forecast of uh, global economic growth for this year. Now, can we expect to see a more positive uh, mood this time around? I would describe it, Uche, as bittersweet. So, on the one hand, yes, we're going through a cyclical change, which means that after some slow growth in 2016, we're starting to see a pickup. But it's by no means satisfying to many of the policymakers meeting here because it's still somewhat tepid. And so uh, what the IMF and the World Bank are proposing is a real revolution in the way that uh, the leadership around the world views 
uh, economic growth, much more in terms of uh, promoting productivity. So that means making the most of individuals, making the most of infrastructure, making the most of the efficiency of the market through education, research and development, the development of much more robust infrastructure going forward. In other words, investing in the things that will provide the best bang for the buck in the future and provide the inclusive growth that has been missing uh, in recent decades. Mm, well, many thanks, uh, Daniel, for that update. Of course, Daniel Ringer is joining us there in Washington. Now, of course, South Africa's new finance minister, Malusi Gigaba, is among African leaders expected at uh, those meetings. Let's get a sense of what to expect. Angelo Coppola now joins us in Johannesburg. Angelo, welcome to the show. Now, we know Gigaba, he'll certainly have to convince investors over there of South Africa's economic stability going forward. He's also meeting with ratings agencies, Moody's, it, to be specific of course to try and prevent another downgrade what are the expectations there well Uche, he's got an uphill battle ahead of him uh, he's new to the portfolio he's not had any meaningful interactions with any other foreign uh, finance ministers and now he's been thrown in the deep end so he's going to face some really tough questions from the foreign institutional investors in the US who have no emotional connection to South Africa or its issues in the meantime, of course, local investors have adopted a wait and see approach to government economic policy pronouncements. And we do understand that he is meeting with that agency only because they have yet to make an announcement about their latest decision. So whether he'll succeed or not remains to be seen. But it is a very crucial time for the finance minister as well as the country. Which are Hmm. Well, Angelo, we know Malusi Gigaba, he is embarking on this uh, first roadshow as finance minister alone uh, without the usual team that we see, including business and, of course, labor officials. Is this a major concern for South Africans? Which that's putting it mildly. It's a huge concern. One analyst suggests that perhaps the finance minister may not really or truly understand the seriousness of the situation that the country is in. And he's not sure that he has, this is the minister, has the support of Labour in the same way that Pravin Gordon had. Um, Gigaba, of course, has to gain the trust of the social partners before he can consider forming that united front that uh, Gordon was so good at doing. And that's going to take some time. In the background, of course, you'll, re you'll recall that business has been very vocal since Gigaba assumed office, calling the second of Gordon a travesty, uh, which directly led to those two agency downgrades that we are experiencing at the moment. Labour, of course, has not been quiet either. The union groups and the SA Communist Party have both called for the country's president to step down. So it's uh, a very tough situation. The minister has put himself out there on his own. Uh, perhaps, hopefully, he can present a, a sort of policy front in terms of the way government's thinking, which are. Well, many thanks, Angelo, uh, for those insights. Angelo Coppola joining us there in Johannesburg.